Dr. CB. Yo, Dunny, we are back. We back. Yeah, this time in a different location. Yeah, so we're kind of here. We're not back. This isn't this is a first timer. Yeah, yeah, it's the first timer. We're the two man traveling podcast band for sure. <laughs> so we recorded the uh the episode we showed today in one location, doing and, the intro in another location. Yeah, yeah. Two different spots. Yeah. It's gonna sound a little different. It's a it's roughly uh twenty five degrees in this what should we name this one? I think, well, it is a shed, literally, yeah. right? So, well, yeah. I, I kind of like sh- shanty. Let's go shanty. Can yeah. we do shanty? Yeah, the shanty pod. I like that. The shanty day pod god? Yeah, the shod god for sure. So this is the this is the place where crossing the chasm happens. Yeah, yeah. hoping some of that rubs off on us. Yeah, it won't. Yeah, we will be sure to, <laughs> might go the other way. Yeah, we might desecrate this oh, shed. Oh, no. This shanty. Hopefully not. Apologies, pod god. Yeah, I trust Brian to keep producing nice pod though for sure. Yeah, so the audio quality is going to sound a little different from this intro to the interview. And additionally, just probably should be straight up, uh, one of our interviewees had the mic turned around backwards. Yeah, yeah, not his fault. We're not putting that on him. (laughs) We'll put that on our producers. Yeah, yeah, (laughs) yeah. Yeah, we'll have a word with them. Yeah, um, and I think we were talking about how that actually brings us closer to our values, right? Yeah. Oh, what of our what are our values again? I think we said inadequacy, ineptitude, ineptitude, and a little less good than averageness. Yeah, something yeah. like that. Do yeah. those all fit? The three, the two ins and and a third yeah, phrase. Two ins and an L. <laughs> Very good. Taking L's all over the place. <laughs> Taking L's. Yeah, oh, man. So who we got today? Man, this is a fun one. This is the first time we've ever, ever interviewed two people. But in this episode, we go beyond flag with the dynamic duo, Jesse Coddington of New Roots Fitness Company and Tim Senna of Avail Tattoo Ooh. Company. Big time. Ooh. So these two grew up in the small town of Fort Sumner, New Mexico, a village with roughly 1,000 residents. Jesse and Tim share the story of what brought them together, growing close friendships through similar interests, what it was like growing up in rural New Mexico and how they maintain their friendship throughout the course of life. They discuss how their upbringing also informs the way they approach and run their businesses here in Flagstaff. Yeah, glad to have them. So I'll, I'll introduce a little bit about Jesse. Jesse is the owner and operator of a local powerlifting gym called New Roots Fitness Company. In this role, he acts as the owner operator and as a personal trainer. He was selected as the 2022 best personal trainer through the best of flag competition. At the time of the recording, we are anxiously awaiting the results to see if he'll make it back-to-back selections. In addition to stacking trophies, Jesse likes to stack steel plates and lift them for fun. The gym has hosted several powerlifting meets and to raise funds for local nonprofits. Currently, New Roots Fitness Company is raising money to eliminate financial barriers for veterans to have 24-7 access to the New Roots Gym. Man, shout out Jesse, huh? Shout out Jesse. We'll see about those best of flag results. And then the next person who we sit with today is Tim Senna, who's the owner-operator of Avail Avail Tattoo Company, which has won the best tattoo shop in Flagstaff every year since 2016, I think it was, right? In addition to keeping Avail between between the rails, Tim's shop has created a culture of connection to the city of Flag through hosting art shows that showcase local artists while also raising funds for local nonprofits. When Tim's not tattooing, eating some version of a breakfast burrito covered in a variety of chilies, or hanging out with his family, he does stonework and sandblasting, and he's one of the only people in the Southwest United States to do this type of work. So at any rate, we could go on for days about how rad these two are, Cody's word rad, (laughs) (laughs) and we'll go ahead and get out of the way so you can enjoy this episode. Thanks for joining us as we go beyond flag with Jesse Coddington and Tim Senna. Welcome to Beyond Flag, a Beyond the Pines production, created by, with, and for the people of Flagstaff building connection in the town we love. We are your hosts, Dr. Daniel J. Phillips, and Cody Bayless, also known as Dr. Chinchilla Nice Nice. Thanks for tuning in as we go Beyond Flag, straight from the Dunny of our observatory. Chateau the Hoos de Phillips today, and we are joined by Jesse Coddington of New Roots Fitness Company and Tim Senna of Avail Tattoo Studio. Thank you guys for coming in today. No problem. Thank you. Man, we this is going to be a little bit of a different interview because this is the first time we've ever interviewed two people at once. Also, I don't think we've ever interviewed people who have basically been friends for their entire life. So 
I think it'll be really fun to, to hear about y'all's experiences well, going up. <laughs> <laughs> and we're off. Yeah, we are here. Yeah. We're also just a disclaimer to the audience. Hopefully, uh, if we can keep 10% of what we record today, we're pretty pumped about that. <laughs> <laughs> so Have you all been friends <clears throat> throughout your lives? When did you all meet? Yeah, we, we, um, we probably met when we were like five, uh, growing up in a town of a thousand. So we were one of 35 year olds in the town and, uh, uh, went to, there's two kindergarten classes and two first grade classes. Um, I was in one of them and he was in the other for both kindergarten and first grade. Then I moved away. My parents split up and I moved away and I moved back in seventh grade and we've been best friends since then. Mm -hmm. Since seventh grade, man. So tell us about growing up in Fort Sumner, New Mexico, right? Rural New Mexico, I guess just mm -hmm. be curious to hear a little bit about what that was like. Well, Fort Sumner is a tiny town. It's right. not even considered a city, it's a village. Yeah. So <clears throat> it's, well, we didn't know this at the time, how weird it was or how, you know, different it was than any other place, but it was just really small, you know? I mean, there was a couple of restaurants, one school, you know, elementary through high school. No stoplights. No stoplights. Still, still no yeah. stoplights. Uh... There is a dollar store now, <laughs> which is a huge deal because you couldn't buy underwear. <laughs> In the whole town before the dollar store, you had to drive an hour away to buy clothes. Right. Yeah. And so. underwear was at the, so that was the biggest issue. Isn't it? Like Usually. Emer er <laughs> emergency <laughs> runs for underwear. Yeah. Well, you just pick up underwear whenever you're going to 60 miles away to the nearest town and uh, to do anything else. <laughs> yeah. Doctor, dentist, go to Walmart, take a girl out on a date. Yeah. yeah, what was the nearest town to you? Like, where would that 60 miles be where you go to take a girl on a date, go to dentist, that sort of stuff? Yeah, so uh, closest, uh, I guess what we would consider at the time a city was uh, Clovis, New Mexico, where there's an Air Force base uh, right on the border of Texas and New Mexico. There's uh, stoplights. <laughs> <laughs> Food. Walmart. <laughs> Underwear. <laughs> Underwear. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so... Um, that's where we go. Actually, in driver's ed, we would have to drive 60 miles to go to practice, uh, you know, using stoplights and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> or, or we would go north of Fort Sumner to uh, Santa Rosa, New Mexico, which was yeah, that's 48 right. miles away. And that would be how we'd practice uh, the on and off ramps of the interstate. Yeah. <laughs> so Santa Rosa for on and off ramps and then Clovis for stoplights. Yeah. <laughs> so driver's ed was like road trips. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. <laughs> Yeah, but, but like I said, we didn't know. We had no idea that it was weird. To, you know, we thought everybody did this. <laughs> we didn't know you could just drive around the block and get freeway, stoplights, you know, all, all that shot. stuff. Hey, yeah, underwear. The whole thing. <laughs> yeah. The whole Would thing. you go pick up underwear for driver's ed? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's a good idea, right? Go run some errands. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Come back. But also back then, so that was, uh, we graduated in 2002, so we were... Uh, going through driver's ed in like uh, 1999 and uh, it's still we were the last year where in New Mexico you could get your full on driver's license at 15 and so mm -hmm. you have to realize that all of us had been driving since we were 13 you right. know whether it be mm -hmm. on ranches or farms or working for you know our dads or whoever so we had all been driving no no person that we ever got in, in driver's ed no person we ever drove with didn't already know how to drive you yeah. know I was already driving dump trucks <laughs> by 12 years old. So, well, another weird thing is is that Fort Sumner is a farm town. So, it's not just a small town, it's a farm town. So, it makes it even more interesting that we all knew how to do that kind of stuff. Most everybody had worked on a farm or did some something like that. Hauling hay or yeah. working with animals or something. Right, so you're working with animals, working on the farm. Um, what else do you guys do? Like, I know you love fishing, right? Like, I just, I wonder what else uh, <clears throat> well, you'd be doing in your free time. Fort Sumner, it has the Pecos River that runs straight through the town um, from the north end to the southeast end. <clears throat> and so, I grew, I mean, we, we all did. We all grew up, you know, maybe a mile away from the, from the river. So, you know, just walking down to the river, you could fish, you could even hunt or you know, any of that stuff. So it was pretty normal. And everyone just grew up doing those things. Yep. Mm -hmm. So it would be like an aberration or an outlier if one of the kids didn't know how to drive that mm -hmm. stuff or do those things. Yeah. yeah, for sure. I remember, um, 
one particular time. Like, yeah, almost everybody's the same. Like, we all play, you know, most of, most of the town is focus around sports, whether it be, you know, like football or basketball or track. We, you know, we were so small, we didn't have baseball. But, um, you know, most of the town gathers around for that. You know, Tim, same thing. He, he played sports uh, up until he got really into, like, competitive motocross racing and uh but you you kind of expect everybody knows how to kind of work on their cars and they're not intimidated by being around cattle or horses or anything like that um we had no idea how country we were until like (laughs) college you know (laughs) but that being said it's still not you know one of the reasons that tim and i end up being like best friends was because we were two of the only skateboarders in the entire town. <laughs> and so, so that was the outlier. Yeah. yeah. That was You guys weird. were the weird kids. We were, we were the weird yeah. kids. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so we, we were like, I, that's kind of, I remember seventh grade uh, English class, probably the first week. And, um, you know, Tim was wearing like a pair of Vans and I, and I was wearing like a pair of Etnies or something like that. And uh, I think it started to like, man, I like your shoes. And, you know, I got your shoes do you skateboard? Like, yeah, I skateboard. And so, and then that's kind of what created that bond for us. And probably like 97, 1997 and nobody else in town was, we, you know, we had to search pretty hard to find some sidewalks to skateboard on. And, (laughs) (laughs) and, uh, and the same goes with, you know, like all the stuff that goes around skateboarding was like, you know, music, you know, we were definitely into alternative music and heavier music and punk and, and hip hop. Um, and so we definitely stood out in that sense and in the way we dressed and we couldn't wait till we got the new CCS magazine to be able to yeah. order, uh, order shirts and hats and shoes and stuff like that. So, uh, and, and, and also being skateboarders in a small town like that, you know, it probably wasn't until it probably, we were like two or three or maybe four years into skateboarding before we ever got to go to a skate park. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Right. So we didn't get all that, you know, we didn't get that influence, but for sure that was one of the things that probably one of our most original bonds. Then we also, same time skateboarders and, and all that, but still into fishing and, and still had to do all the hard work and the, the driving the heavy machinery and, and hauling hay and all that stuff too, at the same time. Yeah. Dang. So you're skating, fishing, hauling hay. Jesse played <laughs> football, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tim motocross. And Tim was in motocross. Yeah. yeah. It was now that I think about it, like looking back on trying to be a skater <clears throat> in a town where, I mean, even music, you know, we didn't, we didn't grow up anywhere near a record store. So we were learning about music through skate videos and stuff like that. And dirt bike videos. We were learning about these, you know, about this culture of skating, not being anywhere near it, which on, is really funny. On a, on a two or three year lag. Yeah. 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 We were behind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> We were really behind yeah. everyone else. So. We were getting into corn when everybody else was getting into ska. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, that, that, that's actually probably to your benefit. Yeah. So you guys had like the fishtail skateboards with the with the big wheels. Exactly. You know, that's oh. not. I'm not yeah. joking about that. Like, I remember having one of those. Yeah. More of a surfer style skateboard, yeah. and having big wheels, and I think somebody came to visit a friend. And I saw their skateboard and it had small wheels on it. And I was like, where do you get the small wheels? And they're like, what are you talking about? At, at the skateboard like, store. I want the, I want the small wheels. And so I had to look it up, CCS magazine, and then, you know, just wait on it. Figure it out. Yeah, yeah. figure it out. Yeah, that's so what I was wondering. Was like the nearest skate shop would it have been in Clovis? No. Or was it, no. That was the I mean, there was, a, there was a sports store in Clovis that carried... Walmart kind of like style Walmart boards, yeah. skateboards, um, but it was two and a half hours away. Yeah, wow. Albuquerque the skate, skate I, shop. Yeah, I, I remember going to in, whenever I would go to Albuquerque. Go to there was two main skate shops in Albuquerque, miles and miles apart from. And I would have my parents take me to both of them, but one was called Skate City and one was called the Beach Zone. And uh, it was like I wanted to be in there for hours whenever yeah. I got to go. Totally. Yeah. I didn't have no money to buy anything, but I remember wanting to be there for hours. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. Yeah. yeah. For sure. So otherwise, all you got all your gear from uh, CCS then. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ordering. Yeah. 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 Very cool. Man, I remember when those would come in the mail, oh like the gosh. catalog. It was like Christmas. The new edition. Time. Totally. <sighs> mm-hmm. totally. But we were always into, you know, alternative stuff. It's kind of funny. Right. You know, I've thought about that, like where the influence came from. But one of them was... This guy, Jeremy, moved from California to 
go to school in Fort Sumner because his mom lived there. And his dad lived in California, but he moved to live with his mom. And he was really into like no effects, um, mm. you know, that type of punk music. He was into skating. He was into California culture. I think he influenced a lot of us in that kind of stuff that, yeah. we, you know, that we're going to school with him. He was a little bit older. And so he would, you know, take us and, you know, take us to football practice or basketball practice or whatever in his truck. And he would be jamming all that kind of stuff. Well, that's one of the things about the small towns, too, that probably people don't recognize is we were hanging out with a whole bunch of older kids, you know, like when I was in seventh and eighth grade, hanging out with juniors and seniors in high school. And then mm -hmm. even after that, they would graduate. And it was probably just because the, we were just attracted to whoever had some sort of, con, you know, int like interest in the same stuff like music or skateboarding or something like that. And so um, thinking, thinking back now, you know, I have a daughter in, that's in seventh grade. And if she was hanging out with a senior in high school, it'd probably be, it'd be the creepiest thing. You know? <laughs> probably. And they were really cool. The first time I ever went snowboarding, yeah. the dude that I was, it was 14. It was my, uh, it was my 14th birthday. So I was in eighth grade and this dude, his name was Jacob and he took me snowboarding three hours away. And I like, got in the truck with him at 4 AM and we drove to Rito, New Mexico. And he helped me, you know, we went to the, to the, um, rental Rental shop, you know, he had to have a credit card to put on file for the <laughs> deposit or whatever, you know, to the, right. and, uh, but it was just different, you know, because our parents probably knew who Jacob was. Yeah. They knew who Jeremy was, yeah. you know, yeah. it's, it's a different situation in a small town because everybody knows each other. Yeah, mm -hmm. right. So if you're like, Hey, Jacob's going to take me snowboarding. They're like, Oh yeah, that's fine. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 No big deal. They know yeah. Jacob, know his family, the whole yeah. thing. Yeah. 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 It's different than in a city where you're like, Oh yeah, this random person's going to take me. Right. You know, to Colorado. <laughs> when I was seventh grade. Yeah. We we still know Jacob. <laughs> yeah. Still in touch with Jacob. It makes me curious. Did you uh do you have ideas about why you were attracted to the thing that was alternative? I don't know. I've I've tried to figure that out myself for myself, but my mom is one of eleven. Her a couple of her sisters, or most of her sisters, are pretty out there kind of hippie ladies so i learned a lot about music and a lot about like oh you should look into this you should check this out you should listen to stevie ray vaughn kind of stuff and i've i've thought i've thought through that kind of stuff trying to figure out if that's where the influence came from um and i think a lot of it came from that just them being open to other things that my parents weren't open to as far as music goes or you know, or that the, the culture in Fort Sumner wasn't into, um, they were into it. And I think that's where a lot of it came from. But I mean, I've thought of that, you know, mm -hmm. quite a bit trying to figure that out mm -hmm. where it all came from. But well, I think uh, what Tim's saying is true for me as well. I think it all started with music for me, you know, mm -hmm. like music was a big deal for my dad. You know, I grew up listening to Bruce Springsteen and CCR and and then my my stepdad was really into rock and roll and and I remember staying up super late after everybody go to sleep and I'd listen to the classic rock station like Ted Nugent and ZZ Top and stuff like that. So I think it definitely started with that. And then I you know I and then I started playing the drums and it just kind of like built off of that. But there is something I think that was always deep inside that I just I wanted to maybe dress different or I wanted to be just like a little bit in that I was always drawn towards that whatever was not the norm and in me being absolutely the norm in high school with playing football is the, that's all I did f played football and lifted weights you know but even then I still so into music and um, you know I may have dressed and looked like a jock but I was still very drawn towards whatever those those things that were alternative I suppose you know like mm -hmm. there's something there's something I guess d deep down inside of me that just did not want to be um, normal or whatever. Yeah. And I think that like, this is separate from our friendship, you know, just individually figuring that stuff out in a small town. It, it was really hard. You know, when we found each other later on, when in seventh grade, we found each other. So we had similar interests, you know, we liked the same type of music. We would hang out together and really bond over those things. But separately, it was really hard before he moved to Fort Sumner, I was kind of alone in that, you know, wanting to skateboard, like some older 
like we were talking about Jacob, a good example. He, he was a skater, but he was older. He was doing his own thing. And I was in seventh grade or sixth mm-hmm. grade wanting to skateboard and wear corduroy pants, yeah. <laughs> you know, around kids that are wearing Wranglers. So it was really strange up until we met. And then we could really, you know, listen to music together, skateboard together, do all that kind of stuff together. It really helped. So you felt lonely before meeting Jesse. <laughs> and still. Yeah. And, still. <laughs> and even lonelier Sorry. after. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it was really strange. Yeah. Yeah, I, I know that when, when Jess started playing football and stuff, I wasn't doing that. So there was a, a little bit of a separation or a friendship, not because of football, but just because of, he was going one direction. I was still kind of doing an alternative direction mm-hmm. as far as our culture goes in Fort Sumner following motocross and still kind of in that alternative thing but once we graduated high school i felt like we kind of reconnected in that stuff and you know i still think even in flagstaff we're doing something totally different in the culture of flagstaff which is really cool i think we'll always Mm -hmm. continue to be different you know whatever we're doing can you summarize the ways that you see yourself as different like then and now what's the congruent difference that you two share? Yeah, I think that <clears throat> the easy one to talk about is like now being business owners, you know, Tim owning a tattoo shop and me owning a gym is there's a few key components that are very similar between the two of us. If you go into Avail, you're probably going to feel a lot of the same vibes as if you go into New Roots. And I think that probably revolves around one, like just like, just like a care for people, you know, I think that whether that be because of growing up in a small town and things just being so much more close or other, other reasons, you know, like whether it be our experiences and in like, you know, Christianity and, and, and ministry and all that stuff at, at some point in our life. But I think that that was like a very clear thing. Even talk about like, even the names, like the, the, you know, the, the name avail and the name new roots, those are, still like kind of human focused, you know, and like helping focused or like one step deeper, you know, it's not like skull and crossbones tattoo shop or iron metal gym, you know, like (laughs) there are things that are just like, I I would like to think just like two notches deeper. Mm -hmm. So I think that the, the sense of the, the like desire to build community is one of the the main things. And then um, also the truth about like growing up in a small town and, and with both of our fathers, you know, being hard workers, you know, I think that we have, we hold some high standards for our ability to, to grind and show up. You know, I worked for Tim's dad during high school and college pouring concrete. And, and we, we, like he said earlier, like we both worked on ranches and farms and, and my dad, you know, was a, was a mechanic and an auto parts salesman. And man, both of those men just came from nothing, like literally nothing you know, like poor, like super poor, both of them and built really amazing things out of hard work. I'd say both of those men are both people that I look up to that are like still, still work freaking super hard. And that's the thing about growing up in a ranching and farming community like that, even though neither one of our parents were ranchers or farmers, the level of hard work is raised, you know, it may be, maybe not the same hustle as like something like LA or Vegas, but the level of having to show up, you know, like the, if you don't show up to feed the cattle, they die, you know? And we knew that we grew up around that, that you just don't really get to take any time off. And, but yeah, so that's, I would, I'd say that's the thing that like currently that, that you would see from, from our, from our businesses. But, um, um, back then, I don't, I don't know exactly why we were so, but it I think it just felt so right. We never even had to talk about like, Hey, let's go skateboard for four hours straight or whatever, you know, it just like kind of happened. And, I'd say that's how it is for fishing for us now or anything we do now. We don't really talk about it. We just like do it, you know, and whenever we go backpacking together, Tim doesn't necessarily have to convince me to fish for five hours straight, you know, like it just kind of happens. It's like a shared understanding in that. Yeah. 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 There's a lot, you know, a backpacking trips with us, not a whole lot of talking. It was like, there's not a whole lot even having to try to figure out who's going to do what. Like we kind of show up to the spot and, <laughs> and every, and we both have our roles and like Tim's the fire guy and, I, you know, and we put the tent <laughs> up together and, you know, it's just kind of this, I'm the meal guy. <laughs> he makes sure there's yeah. a fire. I make sure we get fed. Yeah. <laughs> make sure we get the right amount of calories. <laughs> Flammo and everything's taken care of. Huh? 
Yeah, it's good to hear you talk about. Um, it seems that community finds its way into both new roots and into a veil, and that's something that you mentioned. You would find mm-hmm. um, you could kind of trace back these different roots, and I do wonder part of that that's informed by growing up in Fort Sumner. And then you mentioned also other experiences like working in ministry and that sort of thing. As I think of like the name of Vale, the name New Roots, could you speak to what those each mean or how they how they became those names? Trying to figure out a name for a business is a whole other business you know so you started with to... skull and crossbones yeah and then, yeah, and then went from there uh, iron, <laughs> iron metal. yeah no, um when when i was moving from moving my family from nashville to flagstaff you know jesse flew to nashville my family was already in flagstaff i was still in nashville and jesse flew there to drive back with me to flagstaff which is a 25 hour drive Jess and I talked about that stuff, trying to figure out, because my plan was to open up a tattoo shop as soon as I moved here. That was the plan all along. And so obviously coming up with a name, (laughs) that's part of it. So (laughs) the obvious part is, you know, available. But, you know, to be a service is another part of the definition of avail. I think I'm going to have to go back to what we were talking about earlier is, you know, the I think that what's always set me apart in the tattoo industry for myself is just always wanting community, you know, always wanting to be a part of a community and always looking for something like that. And I think that if you want to track it back to Fort Sumner, I think I've always hoped for that type of community, an alternative community, even within tattooing, you know, I mean, I would, I think if you asked a lot of people and a lot of clients, a lot of people that have worked for me, even within a veil, it's different than the regular tattoo community. You know, just our culture, the way we go about, you know, working with our clients and stuff like that. And that's just just me trying to start something a little bit different. You know, not saying anything about any other tattoo shops in town or anything like that, but just really hoping that I could have a, something a little bit different. And the, the community part or the service part of a veil is really important to Misty and I. Misty being my wife and my, you know, my business partner. You know, we talk about this stuff a lot. You know, we talk about how can we stay relevant in the community, not just take their money and do tattoos on them. That's silly because I definitely don't tattoo just for that reason. You know, I, I, I think if I was a firefighter or if I worked at Walmart, I would still be trying to do these things. It's just tattooing happens to be the thing that I do for a living. But yeah, I think that community and community service has always just been a really important thing from the, the, the moment I started tattooing, not the moment I started avail, but the moment, the moment I started, uh, my career in tattooing. Yeah. So, um, the community aspect shows up there. And then I think of like the, the people that you brought on board to tattoo mm-hmm. alongside you. And I guess I wonder some of the components of the culture at avail and how you could speak to those and like what makes Avail different than if I were to go to okay. just to get a tattoo at another shop? Yeah, you know, it happened naturally. Um, well, so whenever I moved here 10 years ago, um, our plan was to open up a tattoo shop. And, you know, out of respect, I just let all the tattoo shop owners in Flagstaff know that I was doing this and I wasn't going to be... Because that's a big part of the culture of tattooing, not to open up on someone and sure. open up next door to them, you know. That's a normal thing. Like you, you want to be respectful and let everybody know. So I did that. And, um, I also didn't want to hire any people that were working in other shops. I wanted to either stay alone or hire people from outside of Flagstaff or teach someone, someone for the first, I don't know, year or so I was just by myself. And then actually a, a mutual friend of ours, Kyle, um, he, we were having breakfast and he's like, man, you should really talk to this kid, Bryce. Um, he's tattooing his friends out of his house. And I was like, I don't <laughs> like that. I don't want to be a part of that, you know? And he's like, no, man, he's a really good kid. He's, you know, he's really involved with the community and he's a local. And so I was like, all right, give me his number. And so he gave me his number and I text him and we talked for a minute over text and I, and he had been tattooed at my shop by another employee. And, and I said, do you really want to learn how to do this? And he said, yes. And I said, well then come to work tomorrow. And from that day on, 
um, he's been with me. So nine years now, Bryce has learned from me and become a full-time tattooer. And I think he's one of the best in Arizona at what he does. Um, but to me, teaching somebody how to tattoo that, I mean, you could teach anyone how to tattoo. That's not hard, you know. The hard part is teaching them what you really want out of them as far as culture and as far as, you know, just character and things like that. And Bryce is a perfect person to, to do that with because he, he's, he was a good kid that I just basically had to teach him, you know, obviously how to tattoo, but what I wanted from the culture of Avail. And then when I hired somebody else, Bryce and I taught that person, you know, and then we hired somebody else. And the three of us taught that next person. And so it was just a, a natural thing. And now um, I can step away for a week and those guys carry that culture. Whenever I'm gone, they, you know, when we have a guest artist come in to tattoo with us, they know what to expect as far as, you know, this guy's not a fit or this guy is a really good fit in our culture. And so, you know, and I, I think along the way of teaching, I, I've really pushed the, the culture part and the community part and the service part just as much as I would teach how to do a tattoo line, you know? So I think that's where it a lot, a lot of it, you know, just kind of snowballed mm -hmm. just starting with me and then little by little building a team of people that were like-minded. Yeah. Kind of bought into what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. I know we've had side conversations and that's sort of thing we talked in the past about how like when you're gone, like you're saying for a week, like the group kind of regulates itself. Mm -hmm. Like it's just kind mm -hmm. of like the thing is in motion and yeah. Um, well, you know I mean, expect. I guess one thing I made them buy into is that, you know, it's theirs, you know, it's yeah. not just mine or Misty's it's, it's their place. So it's their home. So you're not going to let somebody come in and do something bad to your home. You know, this is your place. So, you know, whenever I'm gone, nothing changes, you know. Um, but recently we have talked about whatever, cutting down hours or, you know, somebody leaving for a week. It really changes the dynamic of the culture because if I'm gone, that piece of that culture is gone. You know, if mm -hmm. Bryce is gone, same thing. If Cisco's gone, same thing. And so, you know, we've, we, we have to kind of balance that out because when somebody comes in on a Monday to get tattooed by us, they're like, what's different about today? You know, like something's mm -hmm. weird in here. And I'm like, Oh, it's a Monday. Tyler's not here. Yeah. You know? And they're like, Oh yeah, that's what's different. You know? And mm -hmm. as much as I like that, I would like to try to make Mondays more like Tuesdays, you know, in, right. as far as culture goes. So. Very cool. And then just does new roots run similar or different to that? Like I wonder the cultural components that you see. <clears throat> Yeah, so similar. I think, yeah. well, uh, like, it's easy for me to, like, boast on and, and brag about Tim, but, yeah, so one of the things, that in, and he kind of touched on a little bit, but I don't think enough, is that when he did arrive in Flagstaff and knew none of the tattooers, none of the tattoo shops, that he did reach out, not just to tell him that he was opening up a shop, but he reached out to try to build a connection and take those dudes out to coffee, you know, and, and it was this is like a good testament it's like so unheard of that they're like what's the deal like what's the catch you know and he was on it like he was genuine i know that that he was genuine well he was like we have this thing very very much in common yeah we we are competitors in a sense you know but we have this one thing that's very in common i'd like to get to know you and become friends with you and that really is like a real genuine thing and that never that never changed he's a lot of respect for the other tattooers and a lot of respect for the other shops um but I'd say that a lot of the same, like a lot of the similarities with, with our gym is, um, you know, Avail treats the infinity symbol tattoo very, very similar to the really, really cool, like dragon tattoo, right? Like your tattoo is important to you and they make you, they, they give it that respect, even if it's not that cool in the tattoo world, right? Like, um, you know, big, you know, big pirate ships and panthers are way cooler than butterfly tattoos. That's just the truth, you know, but objectively, no, it's the truth. It's the truth. <laughs> it's the truth. No. Uh, no, but, but at Avail, what's really cool is that they, um, genuinely still 
make sure that, that their their customers are getting the same experience as the person that's getting the cool dragon tattoo yeah. or right. the cool panther tattoo and that's a real thing you know i've i've witnessed that you know not i've witnessed that from an from somebody from the outside and so to bring it back to like to to the question about new roots about our gym is i'd say that we do the same thing you know like mm -hmm. whether you can you know you've never deadlifted before or you can deadlift uh 815 pounds yeah. uh shout out to xavier <laughs> wiseman uh <laughs> you know uh that we really do like the 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 community at New Roots does he, that we keep we treat it the same you know like that everybody belongs in the gym, everybody should have um, access to 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 the, to free weights the same as cardio equipment mm -hmm. right to the machines the same as the kettlebells and so uh, we really make sure that we're we're trying to make sure that, that people feel that way, yeah. but this place is for you too. The yeah. gym, not just new roots, but the gym is for you too. Cause my, my hope isn't just that people just feel really cool in my gym. It's that, that they'll learn how to take up space whenever they go to another gym mm -hmm. that may not have the same culture. Mm -hmm. It's like, yeah, you go get your bar and you set it up on the, on the squat rack and that's the, that's your thing. You know how to do it. I just taught you how to do that. Or one of my coaches just taught you how to do it. And whenever you go to, when you're on vacation in wherever, that you go and you get the same barbell and you put on the same squat rack and you own that space and you belong there. You belong in the gym, you belong in the weight room. And it's not just for the people that played sports or the people that look fit or the, the skinny people or the muscular people, or the strong people, the athletic people. That's for everyone, you know? Like runners too. Even even <laughs> runners. And triathletes, huh? Yeah. yeah. Did, did you, share, you shared an anecdote with us like a week or two ago about how someone commented, it's really cool that you let those people in there in, in reference to runners with their bands and bridges and that kind of thing. Yeah. No, it, and, um, but it is true. Like every single person, that's like I, even now, even, you know, we have, we have a group of uh, men and women that are in there. I think the youngest is maybe 64, 65. I think the oldest might be 78. Their group of like ten to thirteen that show up every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday to to work out, and we have a specific class for them. And um, you know, originally I had two different gyms. I had one that was just uh, personal training and group classes, and then we I had a second location that was just twenty four hour open gym, and that was kind of like the powerlifting gym. And one of the things that I just couldn't handle was after doing that for a year. It's like I couldn't handle not having the community together, you know, that I would, I'd go to one gym and try to spend some time and, and build community there and get to know people. And then I would spend some time at the other one and just never, I never was comfortable with it. And so I decided to merge them. Uh, I guess it was maybe a year ago, I decided, or a year and a half ago, I merged the two gyms and nobody except for my wife was okay with the idea and, and my buddy Solomon they're the only two people that were like really okay with the idea. Everybody else is like, there's no way those are power lifters. And now we have these, this group, we have this group of 70 year olds and we have this group of uh, personal training clients that, that are used to this private calm studio that, that everything is controlled. And what you're going to bring in these young people, they might take their shirts off. They may be sweating <laughs> all over the place, you know, like, and uh, I was like, I believe that it works. I believe that the, 19 or 20 year old power lifter um, is, is perfectly capable of building a relationship with the 73 year old Anne that comes at 8 a.m. Mm -hmm. And it worked. It absolutely worked. And it's true. We like, because if, if, if you like create that culture that everybody's belongs there and everybody's doing their thing, you know, there's not a standard for how strong you should be, not a standard for how fit you should be, not a standard for who is okay to, to be in the, in the freeway area. You know, one of my, one of the biggest pet peeves that I have about commercial gyms or like global gyms is they have this huge cardio area and that's like the safe place so you go into uh, who cares what planet fitness yeah. right like you go into planet <laughs> fitness and there's 50 pieces of cardio equipment over here 
you know, in this one area. Then you go to the next, like the yellow. So that's the green safe zone. And then the next zone <laughs> is the, the machine area, right? The machine area is safe because you just sit on it and you start moving things around, levers around. And then the real scary part is the freeway area where the dumbbells are and the barbells are. And, and it's like the, usually it kind of, it, unfortunately, it's like the, the, the real confident, strong males end up over in the free weight area. And then the people that are brave enough to dabble in strength training end up in the machine area. And then everybody else that's new to fitness ends up on the elliptical machine and the treadmill. Terrifying. <laughs> terrifying. <laughs> that, terrifying. So our, you, our gym is up? nothing like yeah. that. Yeah. So, we yeah. have every, uh, we have cardio equipment sprinkled into the, into the free weight. Area. Yeah. 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 The yeah. whole gym is a free weight area, you know, right. but that, but that's on purpose. And every gym I worked at, you know, I worked at a big gym in Phoenix, um, for, for almost two years. And I worked in, in different gyms all throughout college. And it's always that same setup, you know, it's like, there's a safe place where you can just kind of be, you know, alone and nobody's going to notice you. And then it gets scarier and scarier into different sections. Hmm. And, uh, I never did. I never wanted that. I never wanted any female to come into my gym and feel like they needed to like hide in a corner because they're going to be um, stared at or hit on or anything like that. You know, and that's I think I think we've done a pretty good job of that at New Roots of creating a culture where females, you know, can can train and lift hard and not feel like they're going to be, you know, asked out every second or hmm. Or whoever can do whatever, like integration, right? Mm -hmm. You're basically talking about integration. Like people can come in and use the space how they want it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Whether it I be think it's just, well, sorry. Um, I think whenever I walk into the gym, like I was there for the Halloween powerlifting comp. Is that what you? Night of the a Living Deadlift. Night of yeah. the Living Deadlift. It was a deadlift competition. Deadlift. Deadlifting. Get it right. I said powerlifting. I'm sorry. <laughs> deadlifting competition. <laughs> He's going to light you up now. Um, yeah, whenever I walked in, I you know, the, the place just screams confidence, you know, like from the little person that may not be able to deadlift very much to the 815 pounder guy, you know, everybody has confidence, mm -hmm. you know, the way that they look, the way that they talk, the way that, you know, and that's a huge deal in gyms to have confidence like that. You know, you don't have the guys just kind of walking on the treadmill or the ladies just walking on the treadmill scared to go interact. Everybody, it's a family. Mm -hmm. It's a family of people that feel like they're wanted there, you know? And so, yeah, I mean, I think that in, in both businesses, I think that confidence is a real thing, mm -hmm. you know, where people really feel like I'm supposed to be here. Mm -hmm. you know yeah. yeah and i think with um like with new roots i think of both your shops really is that you've been able to inject your personalities into them and so i think of new roots in the back wall like for our listeners who maybe never been there there's all these new roots is very black all the walls are black and then the back wall has all these pictures and photos and i guess i was wondering if you could speak to the i guess maybe the thinking behind it or what helped you come up with that idea yeah i think that that kind of is almost exactly like what I was talking about where um, I, I, I'd seen somewhere a long time ago, these like big pictures of like Arnold, maybe it's, maybe it's even like Gold's Gym Venice, maybe, I, but it's common to have pictures on the wall at these old school bodybuilding gyms. Usually they're framed, it's old bodybuilders. And then there's like kind of like random trophies and, and, and uh, medals on the wall and stuff. So that's like a common thing in those old school gyms. Even the gym I grew up in, in, for Sumner, like a little side note was it was this old grocery store that was converted into a teen center, a teen rec center. And it was really funded by um, this gentleman named Michael Sinna. And he uh, he was a bodybuilder. He's local from from Fort Sumner, played sports and all that stuff. And uh, he really was a big part of getting this thing done. It was funded by the Mothers Against Drunk Driving, it was like a DWI funded program mm -hmm. where from like 4 p.m. to 7 p.m. Tuesday through Friday, it was open so kids could come and there was video games and pool tables and ping pong tables. And you had to like turn in a shoe to get a ping pong paddle or something like that. So there's all these young kids from the neighborhood that are walking around with one shoe playing ping pong. And But anyways, uh, half of it was a weight room. And that's where I grew up and there's posters on the wall and pictures on the wall 
of various bodybuilders, you know, the kind of the centerfold out of a flex magazine or muscle fitness magazine. Um, so that was already kind of ingrained in me. Um, but also I never wanted, <laughs> never wanted anything to be like too tacky. And so I was like, man, it'd be cool to have these big murals, but, um, like, how do we, how do we like make that also less intimidating or more like connected to something just a tiny bit deeper than bodybuilding or tiny bit deeper than powerlifting or strongman. And so I created this wallpaper. It's kind of, it's like uh, pretty much like wheat paste graffiti art wallpaper in the gym that's 12 foot tall and I don't know, 30 foot wide. And it's just literally, I just like collages in black and white that I did on my computer yeah. and, and got them printed off at Staples and made this, uh, this collage. But, um, it's anywhere from like, there's pictures of me and Tim when we were skateboarders, when we were like in totally. seventh grade, there's pictures of our kids, you know, there's pictures of our grandparent, my grandparents, like there's pictures of like my football teams and there's the, you know, there's anywhere from the rock to, uh, old school bodybuilders and, you know. Arnold and and all, Franco Colombo, like all these people, it's all mixed together. So when you see, oh, and then the other thing that's like one of my favorite parts about it actually is all these old school ads, like from anywhere from the 1920s to yeah. the 80s, you know, uh, with these these fitness ads that are so ridiculous, like talking about, you know, there's one that's like you can purchase tapeworms to help you lose weight and um, yeah, yeah. and like old magazine articles about like how to bulk up or how to and just depending on what was the trend at the time. Some of them were like, are you tired of being skinny? And then there's like a, <laughs> like somebody in a, a female in a bathing suit, like, are you tired of being skinny? And like nobody looking at you. And then there's one that's like, do you need to reduce your flesh? We'll try this like yeast or something. Yeah. You know? <laughs> uh, but anyways, that, yeah. So that, I would say that that for me is when people look at it, they see this really cool black and white aesthetic. And then they start looking and they see some muscles and then they see like a picture of my son when he was, you know, a year old sitting on a box in the, my very first gym, you know, totally. like that, that sort of stuff is like, for me, it's real personal for me. I see it, you know, it means mm -hmm. a ton to me, but I would say also that that's one of the standout aesthetics in, in the gym that means a lot to other people. Cause I think if they really start looking at it, it's like, man, this isn't just about fitness. Mm -hmm. It's not just about muscles. Like this dude's family's up here or like, why is that? That's a strange picture to be up there. What does that mean? You know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. Oh, I think it's incredible. I think that's the thing that kind of brings the community into that is that it's not just, yeah, people lifting a lot of weight, but people from a variety of sports or athletics. It's your own personal experiences. It's the experiences of your friends, your family. They're all up there. Yeah. And I would even going back one more step about like even the name New Roots, you know, so um, I worked at a big global gym. I worked at a Bally's, Bally's Total Fitness in Phoenix and um real successful gym you know throughout the united states and i could tell that it was like crashing like it, it was like bombing and uh i was like i need to be able to control my i need to be able to control my experience with my personal training clients and so i decided to go out um and be an independent personal trainer and with that you don't need a like a name it could be jesse's personal training you know i could ta file my taxes however i wanted but I remember wanting a name and had all these different ideas. Like, like, and most of my clients at the time were weight loss clients, like people that were like changing their lives completely, losing a hundred pounds, 130 pounds, that sort of thing. And so I remember thinking like, well, maybe like a name like new beginnings or uh, Genesis or something like rejuvenate or something like that. And my buddy Rustin had this idea of like the name new roots and, and it like just stuck, you know, it was like, at a time, and this is like in early two, uh, like mid two thousand, like two thousand eight, maybe. Um, the Biggest Loser was a really popular show on TV. A lot of the personal training studios that were popping up in the Phoenix area were all about like weight loss challenges and results only, and like body fat percentage and weighing, and like it was just a real big deal to try to lose weight. It was right before this really cool thing that happened currently, which is how important strength is, and which is an amazing thing in the fitness industry. But I just like, I hated the idea of it being about the results, about just losing weight, and like money back guarantee, if you train with me, uh, you're gonna lose 20 pounds no matter what. Mm. It was like so much more to me, it was about like, well, let's just change what's at the bottom, and whatever happens at the top, we'll, hopefully we're good with. So we can fix our attitude towards 
our body or our attitude towards fitness or attitude towards, uh, attitude towards nutrition. If we can change that at the very bottom, then at the roots, then whatever happens at the top, then we're, it's, it's supposed to be versus what I felt like at the time was everything was focused on the top. Like let's trim the leaves or trim the branches or, you know, decorate the bark, you know, like let's shrink the, shrink the tree and it doesn't matter what's at the bottom. And so that's really, for me, like, it still stands true. Like, even though I don't like work with a whole lot of weight loss clients anymore, but it's still at the very bottom. If you change the way your attitude towards your body, movement, food, then even if your body doesn't necessarily change, your mind will change and you'll be more, you know, comfortable with yourself and walk through life, which is with so much more confidence and, 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 and confidence allows you to experience so much more. Mm-hmm. Well, I think it comes through, man. Like I think of our first, um, so when Dan and I came to train with you probably a year and a half ago, February, maybe two so years 20 ish months. Yeah. Wow. Like I remember you <laughs> asking us, why do you like, what do you want? <laughs> what are you doing here? Kind of thing. And I remember like my response was like, I just don't want to really get hurt running. Like that was kind of my thought about it. And you're like, no, nah, we're going to make you stronger. Like overall. And I remember you talking about consistency and sticking with it, that sort of thing. And so I think with you speaking in that way, like kind of in a more whole sort of way, not just focusing on this one sort of thing, it made um, the process of going to the gym more, I would say, rewarding in a sense. It made mm-hmm. like kind of fits where I'm at with whatever I'm doing, if that makes sense. Yeah. And then I think your passion for it really shines through. And I think that's what comes through in both of your, both of your spots. I think that comes through in the gym, that comes through in the shop too. Um, I was just thinking about best of flag. I know the voting ended for this year, but best of flag for our listeners is this competition, right? I think it's hosted by the newspaper Mm -hmm. and people can vote up to once a day in a variety of categories. Tim avail has won best of flag tattoo shop. How many years now do you, well, we can't, it's hard to count at this point, right? (laughs) We're not supposed to announce anything, but six years, six years up until this one that we're everybody aware. knows about yes okay <laughs> six years in a row yeah okay so six years in a row it'd be cool if it was seven. Oh, it would be amazing <laughs> man yeah, that'd yeah. be so cool and we just, will uh, celebrate to just drop that <laughs> announcement now wouldn't that be cool yeah, that'd be so cool in four weeks if you know this podcast will be released in roughly three months with, <laughs> yeah. how, with how well we've edited <laughs> recently our so. producers That's have gone eight, real lax eight best yeah. of five so hypothetically <laughs> you may have won yeah yeah I'll just go ahead and say ten no um, six six in a row. Six best yeah. of flags. So it was 2016 yeah. was our first um, best of flag. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So six in a row. And then Jess, you, you uh, New Roots has won. Was it best gym or is it best personal trainer? What's the category? Yeah. So that... we've been winning. Uh, we've won best personal trainer. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, we held down that second place spot really, really well for, I think, four years. And then, <laughs> and then, won, yeah. and then won best of flag for for two years in a row. Yeah, very cool. And so I think of that thing um, as being representative of the way in which you both have connected with the community. And so beyond just hosting a gym, beyond just doing tattoos, y'all both do a lot of events in the community. And I was wondering if you could speak to the the ways that you engage the community um, with each each of your shops. You know, I'm just naturally always wanting to do stuff. You know, I think we both are. I think we're both like that. Like I'm, I probably have some ADHD situations in my life where I just can't and my wife my wife's the same way she may not say that but she's the same thing um ADHD we just situation <laughs> so it's not, it's not, not. Yeah. Um, yeah we just don't we don't like to sit around you know and yeah. I mean really when we sit down and talk about stuff like this um you know what what kind of event are we going to do are we going to do a fundraiser are we going to do whatever we we always start we usually start the conversation by saying, like, we got to do something, you know, like we, we haven't done anything in a couple months, you know, we need to do something here. I personally always want the community to know that we're willing to give back to the community as far as, you know, even financially. Um, I mean, we, we give away annually thousands of dollars of gift certificates or just giveaways you know, on our own. And then we donate a lot of gift certificates to other fundraisers throughout the year. Um, but it really just comes back to just always wanting to do stuff. You know, like we have this opportunity, we have a good following in town. Um, why shouldn't we be the ones doing it? You know, we should always be the ones doing it. Um, 
not to say like we, we encourage all the shops to be a part of everything we're doing, you know, tattoo shops. Um, they rarely ever do, but you know, we're, I'm always encouraging them and inviting them to be a part of whatever we're doing, whether that's an art show or a fundraiser or, you know, whatever it is. Um, yeah. So we, we recently just started doing art shows a couple times a year and we invite artists of all kinds, tattooers, you know, jewelry makers, you know, kids that want to paint on cheap pincher paper, whatever, like it doesn't even matter, you know, um, just to get people involved in art, um, and get people involved in hanging out together. Um, all those things. So people come from Phoenix, can pe people come from all over Flagstaff, adding their art into it and hanging out and looking at art, but also buying art and donating. We, we donate that, donate that money to a certain nonprofit. Mm -hmm. And we like to start doing that a couple times a year, um, just to hang out and, you know, obviously raise money for something and, and get people together. And me personally, I would love for tattooer, more tattooers and Flagstaff to get involved with that stuff mm. because I think it's really, it's too quiet in the tattoo industry in Flagstaff. Yeah. There, there's not a, not a lot of movement. There's a lot of tattooing going on, but not a lot of movement within the community to give back. Mm. So I think Avail is doing a really good job of always wanting to be a part of something um, going on in the community. And we're just going to continue to grow that, you know, whatever it is. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah, very cool. In the the most recent art show, who was the beneficiary of the money that you were able to raise? Who'd you give that to? It was, um, oh, it was the, I'm sorry, the, the food bank. Food bank. Oh, yeah. Yeah, very the cool. uh, family food center. Yeah. And so, I mean, even that, man, it's so strange in town. You know, it's just like the, uh, even the toys for tots thing. When When we call them, even the family food center, they were surprised. Yeah. Like we were like, hey, we want to do this fundraiser for you guys. You know, can you guys be there? Can you have some, you know, staff there explaining what you guys do? And they're like, uh, yeah. I th it, so I just think that there needs to be more things like that in mm -hmm. Flagstaff, not just in tattoo shops, but just in general, because I'm always surprised on how surprised they are mm -hmm. yeah. at people approaching them or businesses approach approaching them to do fundraisers. It's right. like, this is how you raise your funds, right? Like <laughs> doing fundraisers. It's like, I'm not really sure, but I, I'm pretty sure that's how you totally. get your money. But um, yeah, so, so we're just going to, you know, we obviously, you know, so my wife has a nonprofit that works in the country of Haiti. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to hopefully do one art show a year for her nonprofit mm -hmm. and then one art show a year for something local. Yeah, and then just for New Roots, you've done a lot of events. I know you had the power sloths. Is that the right? Yeah. You know, New, Root, New Roots um, started in 2008 when I left um, the corporate gym world and, and started. And it was just for, for till 2013, it was just me working out of another gym as New Roots. So it was Jesse was like New Roots. And so um, then 2013, we opened our first gym and then we had did that right up until the pandemic. And so in 2020, um, one of my buddies, his name's Solomon, he had this organization or this is like a club. It's kind of a club. It's kind of a brand. It was kind of just like, I think it started as an intramural football team. It's called the Power Sloss. And um, he was, he was a, he's a popular strongman competitor and, and, and um, powerlifting athlete. And so he had this desire and he actually did it. He, he ran the very first strongman competition in northern arizona and during the pandemic and it was amazing they have 50 competitors no no spectators whatsoever and we we teamed up with this desire to start running these strength sport events powerlifting and strongman um and just to remind like a strongman is like when they pick up the big stones and, and that stuff <laughs> that you see on espn powerlifting is different powerlifting is your best squat plus your best bench press plus your best deadlift and that's your total score. So some people get a little, a little confused. So anyway, since since 2020, uh, late 2020, uh, we've run, I think we're, we're about to host our either 11th or 12th event 
since then wow. of strongman and, and, and powerlifting. But one of the things is we've had some of the strongest competitors in all of Arizona, not, you know, not just Flagstaff from Tucson, from Phoenix. And we put on these amazing events and I like, I'm very proud of them. I'm proud of the work that we've done and the feedback we've gotten from everybody is like, you know, that we're efficient and the most, you know, the best vibes and, and all that stuff. But one of the things that just kind of goes perfect with, with new roots is that Solomon had the same desire as me to bring strength and bring fitness to the normal folks to make strength and, and strength sports like powerlifting and strongman accessible to the regular people. And that we, we sold out our, our previous powerlifting meet within weeks of opening it had f- over 50 competitors with a list of like 15 that were on a, on a wait list to get in. And like 70, like 80% of the people that were there that competed is their first time competition, you know, and the vibe was huge. Like was, was another level. Um, we had a live DJ, we had, you know, the lights were off. We had spotlights and, and all this stuff with against the banner on the, on the stage. And, um, we had a videography crew. It was just like this whole different experience for these people that were just so normal that they had trained for it, Mm -hmm. but these were not power lifters. You know, this was their first time ever doing this. And they got one of the best experiences that, that other power lifters that have probably done, uh, you know, that have been competing for 10 or more years have never experienced something as fantastic as this. And it's because Nobody really cared what the competitors were lifting. They don't really know the difference. You know, it's in kilos, by the way, and we don't know the math on that. You know, so (laughs) nobody really could care if somebody was deadlifting 200 pounds or 600 pounds because it was just like they were so supportive of the person and their and their their bravery to get up on stage and do this thing that they trained for. And, and they put themselves, got themselves out of their comfort zone. And I just couldn't be more proud of that. Those events not because they are run well, like that's cool. I'm glad that we run them well, you know, that they get started on time and end on time. Like I'm very <laughs> proud of that. Uh, but I'm mostly proud that these just like normal everyday people can get up there and get the same um, attention and support as somebody that's been doing it for forever. That is like trained and trained and trained and it actually may hold some records. You know, they got the same applause, record holders, same applause as the normal everyday, you know, 37 year old mom that, you know, that, that is a dental hygienist. (laughs) (laughs) Sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, those, those things, uh, and, and, and we try to do some, some other things, some other, um, some other events to, you know, to, to raise awareness for certain things, like hosting certain things in, in the community, like hosting the, the popular, uh, Murph workout on Memorial day. Um, we're actually in with one of uh, one of the tattooers that works at Avail. His name's Tyler. He's he does most of the art for our um, for all of our merch, and he just made uh, like this super cool art that we're getting printed to uh, to sell some T-shirts to um, c- create a scholarship fund for local veterans uh, to be able to give memberships to. And with the idea of the membership, you know, anybody can work out. They can do push-ups in their backyard, but the membership is to create community, right? right. And so of these cool T-shirts that will be coming out that have a bald eagle and, you know, all traditional style tattoo stuff and a barbell and uh, be selling those and all that money will go into a fund to create these scholarships for, for local veterans. Yeah. yeah. Think of like, that's the intention behind the thing that you end up producing, right? Is it's like, you can always work out in the backyard, but uh, what we're trying to do is create community. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I think that, Absolutely. I think that becomes recognized um, throughout the town and it's obvious on what you both do in your work. Yeah. It's like coming full circle listening to you too. Cause uh, you know, we started talking about Fort Sumner and you two talking about it took intention to create community there. And so you watch these people that you admired and aspired to be like in terms of hard work and work ethic and that living in a town like that, um, it was expected you worked hard and you guys did that. Mm-hmm. But then you also, uh, realized how it took intention to create community. It can, you can hear both those elements so profoundly and the things that you're talking about, that it takes a lot of effort and intention. And the outcome of that is a lot of shared community. So it's cool to hear it, it, Like it's, it's like hearing the, how your roots inform yeah. what you currently do. 
Yeah, it's hard. It, it's not natural to work as hard as Tim does and also take the time and the sacrifice to create community in that, you know, mm-hmm. like it's easy to be like, no, I'm going to work my ass off what she does and to make money for my family mm-hmm. to provide this really great experience for my family and, and to work hard for his employees, which he does. But like it takes, like you're saying, intention and sacrifice to also value community, mm-hmm. which isn't necessarily maybe in turn will make him some more money down the road, but that's not the goal behind it you know the mm-hmm. sacrifice and the and the taking the time out that's the that's that's a, that that's a sacrifice and that's mm-hmm. what he's he's doing and not for the money of it i suppose well mm-hmm. <clears throat> going back to the best of flag thing you know this is this is 10 years of realizing these things uh, and learning these things whenever i first moved here and started a business you would hear about best of flag but it it was kind of dying off a little bit and, um, you know, this is not coming from me. This is coming from other people that had been living here before I moved here. People were saying that, you know, people were saying, eh, people don't really think about that anymore. They don't really go off of that when they're looking for a restaurant. And I don't know if that was completely true, but that's what people were saying and people were thinking. When we won Best of Flag in 2016, the first time, we weren't even on the list before that for the first three years. We weren't on first, second or third list. And so when we won, we were like, what? <laughs> you know, like, that's amazing. So, you know, the, the Best of Flag um, did a write-up in the Best of Flag Winners Edition magazine or whatever on the shop. And they, you know, talked about us winning, you know, without being on the list and all that stuff. We were already thinking how to build a culture around community before we won. Mm-hmm. We had been doing that from day one. So, so little by little, we just kept building and building on this idea of community, giving back, culture, treating people well, community um, or customer service. Now, <laughs> it's kind of ironic that, and, and I'm excited about it, really excited about it, that other shops are starting to put effort into trying to win Best of Flag stuff. Mm-hmm. But at this point, they're going to have to which I would love for them to do, but they're going to have to almost play catch up on those things, community, you know, customer service, all of those things that we've been doing for 10 years from day one. And so I I would love for that to happen, you know, because that only makes everything better in the tattoo industry and Flagstaff. So I, I really, I like the idea of them now trying to get the best of flag. Um, um, but it's, it is going to take a lot of work and that work is good. You know, that work is really good. Being a part of the community, doing fundraisers, you know, um, just all of those things are good things. Nothing is, right. you know, none of that is about making money um, as, as far as what we do. But in the end, it will make you, more, you know, like y- your business will be better and busier because of those things. But right. the community will be better um, because of those things also. So that's what I always tell anyone that that's in the tattoo industry that's either just tattooing or owns a tattoo studio. You know, I do have people ask me all the time, like, how do you guys stay so busy when it's not busy? I'm like, well, we do all these things throughout the year that are giving back and, and you know, maybe even putting a spotlight on our business a little bit. Um, but, you know, just these things to, to get the community involved in what we're doing. So that way... We're, we're busier as a shop. We're doing more tattoos. The guys are able to make more money, but we're also giving back all the time. So, you know, you have to do one. You can't get, you know, one without the other. So, right. right. Yeah. yeah. And just the saying, like, um, it takes a lot. It takes us um, beyond just tattooing and running the shop and keeping that financially afloat and that sort of thing. It takes a lot of intention and effort to mm-hmm. do the stuff beyond that. And it's a net gain for the community if other shops were to do that. Oh, my God. Start doing uh, yeah benefits for nonprofits and that kind of thing. Yeah. That's my dream. You yeah. know, honestly, yeah. that's yeah. my dream is that, you know, tattooing would just be this thing that we do on people, Yeah. but the business of tattooing would be this vehicle to do other things, you know, because tattooing is popular. Everybody knows about tattooing. Everybody mm-hmm. wants to go into a tattoo shop and experience it and be a part of it and look cool with them, whatever. Yeah. And we should take, 
advantage of that because people are wanting to be a part of it, then make a fundraiser out of it. Right. You know, people are already want already wanting to be a part of it. Let's utilize those things. Mm -hmm. And Flagstaff it would be a great place to do that. You know, it yeah. Phoenix obviously, you know, there's hundreds of tattoo shops. Flagstaff maybe 15 tattoo shops. Um, and if we all were able to do something, that would be amazing for Flagstaff, you yeah. know? Mm -hmm. So yeah, I'm pushing for it. Yeah. Oh, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Is it goes similar in kind of the gym world in that way? Um, yeah, unfortunately in the, in the gym world, um, I would say similar to, I'd say similar to tattooing, but, um, lots of egos, right. And lots of philosophies mm -hmm. about on training. And so it is really hard to connect with other, um, other people in the fitness industry because of those egos. You like, mm -hmm. and I, and I think there's some of us out there that are, that are putting the effort in and I have great relationships with some of the other gym owners in town. Um, but it's hard to connect. It's hard to be able to, it, you know, something I mentioned earlier is like one of the things that me and the other owners of the gyms in town have like in common is that we like working out, yeah. you know, a lot. And that should bring us closer together versus this idea of like me versus you or my gym is uh, we do this sort of thing versus that sort of thing, you know. And um, yeah. um, I've always I've always wanted that like actually a long, long time ago when I first started, tried to create this. I sent out letters of all things. I don't even remember the last time I wrote a letter, but <laughs> I had sent out letters to all the owners of the other gyms in town, like inviting them to be a part of this like yeah. fitness professionals alliance or something like that. And and uh, I could probably do it a lot easier now. It'd probably be a little bit easier to connect now versus 10 years ago when I did it. But yeah. um, it's just hard in this industry to connect. You know, it's yeah. really hard, which is, I think that what Tim's wanting and what I'm wanting is that desire to be able to, to connect and, and come together to be able to do things for the community because the community needs movement. You know, the community needs fitness. The community, community needs um, to get healthier, right? We have plenty yeah. of people that are, you know, that, that are outrageously unhealthy, that don't know where to start. And kind of going back to what I said about not belonging, it's like if you're overweight and you're pre-diabetic and you're 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 sad, you're depressed from not moving, it is man, it's fucking hard to get in a gym. You know, yeah, it's yeah. hard to walk through the door. And I'm hoping more and more that people would that the new roots would have the reputation for being the place where you show up however you want, you know, and those people are gonna care about you. Yeah. I don't know if I answered the question. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I've never seen you bashful. I love this. Um, I, gotta, I could speak to that. Like, I'm that guy. I came into your gym. I didn't know the first thing about free weights. Yeah, that, to that environment was totally new and intimidating to me. And yeah, over that span that Cody and I have been there, I've been that, that guy you spoke about where I've traveled and went to a gym. I had one small mishap, but otherwise it was okay. <laughs> I couldn't find, do you remember that? The clips? Cody, yeah, the clips I couldn't something. find the clips for the end, and I was benching, and it was a little, little too much, and it came off one side. Luckily, I was literally the only person in there, so I just played it off like, yeah. There's like, cameras. We see it. Yeah. Well, you know, so one of, the the rules that, yeah. one of the rules of New Roots is if you're benching alone and nobody's in there, you're not supposed to yeah, use Yeah, so clips. you can dump them yeah. off. Yeah. So you don't die. So I tried to pretend like, yeah, I tried to pretend yeah, like, like this is all on purpose. I stood up, you know, rearranged the bar. <laughs> yeah, the camera footage. Put I'm a sure fake mustache on. <laughs> And then I went upstairs and told Cody, they don't have any clips down there. Yeah. And then Cody promptly went and worked out that afternoon and sent a picture of the clips. All the clips, a bucket of them. Yeah. 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 Can't miss this. No, yeah. for sure. Yeah. I'd say, you know, that, um, you, you know, you guys are both a perfect example. I love whenever I see you in the gym working out, you know, by yourself, not just working with me and uh, owning that space, you know, maybe not just like trying to make friends with every single person, but you look like you belong, you know, because you do belong. And, uh, um, I, you know, I always love whenever I get there early in the morning, I see, you know, Dan in there or, you know, get to see, you know, Cody coming in and setting up stuff, you know, setting up things that are hard, not the easy stuff. Like that's the thing when people come into a gym and they're not very familiar with training, they usually go to whatever's easiest. And so we don't have elliptical machines in our gym. Yeah. <laughs> but like, again, regular gyms, people will spend money because they want to be fit. They want to better themselves. Yeah. They don't necessarily know how, 
So they go, they buy a gym membership, and they go, and they go to whatever is the simplest that they don't feel like they're going to look stupid on, mm -hmm. and they start moving on that thing. And a lot of times it's a treadmill, a lot of times it's an elliptical machine. And then the next thing is the cable machines, right? So, them or mm -hmm. bicep curls, you know, and so they go over and they start doing bicep curls. And you like, just, just so we all can know, you never start workouts with bicep curls, right? You're like, that's not the thing that you do. Like, yeah. you're gonna always Oops. start with the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it like, uh, Unless it's a bicep huge. only day, you know? <laughs> it's just biceps. I also, so the assault bike, that's one of those easy ones, right? Yeah, it's a uh, easy. Uh, first, <laughs> first, literal first day. <laughs> Thursday, Cody, Cody and I, Cody, Cody and I showed up. You're like, why don't you two just jump over on the assault bike so I get warmed up, and then we'll dip into some of this other stuff. And uh, Cody couldn't get the seat on the bike adjusted, so you said, you said to one of your coaches, you said, "Hey, Garrett, can you go over and help the doctors fix their bikes? Help the doctors." Get the bike to work. Uh, it, it, just so we know, I, G, I give these guys way more grief than I would normal people. <laughs> oh, but they come it. for yeah, it. That's, yeah, not us. That, that's not an indicator of you not being. That's like on us. Yeah, I mean, anytime you give us any grief, it's all it's all on us. It's appropriately matched. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, not being able to adjust the bike seat. Yeah, that's <laughs> yeah, that pretty bad. Oh man. It was, uh, I'll forever remember that. Help hey, will you go over and help the doctors figure out? How to no, get you the know, bikes? In, in your defense, in your defense, you weren't there when the uh, the trainers from Corporate Assault Bike came and taught everybody how to do it. Yeah, <laughs> how to adjust, how to pull the knob and move it. You missed that day. Yeah. <laughs> how to just pull the knob out and move it up or down. <laughs> Oh, man. Uh, yeah, it was good times. That's the worst. It's, it's so cool. I appreciate you two being willing to carve out some time to come and share this. It's really cool to hear how some of what felt so alternative to you, you two had such broad interests and you had to learn how to apply the, the hard work into different areas of your lives, different than just what was expected in that town. And all that intention and the desire for community, it's clear how it's tied to some of those early roots. And so it's cool how you two have done it jointly together and I appreciate you taking some time to share how you did it all. We, we do log off typically asking people, our last question we like to ask is, um, how would you describe what Flagstaff means to you or how would you describe your connection to the town? I guess just for each of you, how would you speak to that? Yeah. So we grew up in the plains of New Mexico where it's flat, you know, and things are, are simple, right? Like, uh, you can see for forever and, a lot of times people stay there for forever and you know once we, once we moved away i think we really started realizing how much we uh valued our time there and it's like a really special place to us eastern mexico is and uh uh but i think we had no idea what the mountains of flagstaff would do to us you know to our hearts to our souls and um i'm i'm good to be buried in this town and i love I love that there is this like attitude of, you know, people sometimes go and hike, go on hikes that other people from other places would train for like six weeks for, you know, it's like, Hey, you want to go hike Eldon tomorrow at lunch? And like, it's this like idea of adventure and idea of like, yeah, I want to see what's up there. Right. And so I don't mind doing that super hard thing. And, um, I think that we both found, um, uh, those small, the small bit of pieces of, of community for us. And, and still, you know, we, even though we both have lived in Phoenix, we, you know, coming from a town of a thousand people, Flagstaff still really big for us, sure. you know, but each year I think that it gets a little bit closer where it's like, I'm at the grocery store and I see somebody that I know and, and I feel like I'm, you know, a part of it and making a difference. And so, uh, Flagstaff for me is, um, it's, it's beautiful and it's, it's home and it's adventure and, um, and make no mistake that it is hard work to live here. And so the people that end up here, I believe have had to put in that effort. And there's like a term here in Flagstaff called like, you know, doing the Flagstaff hustle. And it's usually these people that are working that you know, want to do this career, whatever it is. And then they're bartending at night and then having to take this other job. And then they're living in the, the back alley with three other people because the cost of living is so damn high, you know, like people that end up living here, I believe have to freaking they have to work for it. And I know I did, you know, I, when we first moved here, you know, um, this is a side tangent, but, um, and you know, Tim and I married sisters, not our own. 
Not each other's. <laughs> That's a Fort Sumner. Yeah. That's gonna be. Yeah. We married That's some sisters. So for, you're from Fort Sumner, and you married your sisters. <laughs> yes. No, we, we married some there. sisters. Yeah. We married no, some, some sisters, some sisters of the uh, that were from Flagstaff. Years. You know, and um, <laughs> so we live. We live a couple houses down from each other. Our kids are homeschooled together. Um, you know. Um, and and we're brothers, <laughs> we're brother-in-laws. Uh, so there's a lot. It goes like a couple levels deeper than we talked to. But um, um, that being said, whenever I moved here, it was because Mandy, my wife Mandy's family lived here, and so we wanted to be closer to family. We we, we kind of were a little bit over the Phoenix scene, and um, I worked I worked a night job and trained in the morning, and I did that while we had children and all that stuff, and it was really hard. It was a real big struggle to be able to afford to live here and to be able to stay here, but it was always worth it because of the mountains, because of the trails, because of the community, because of, you know, our friendships. Um, and so that I'd say for, for me, that's, those are those things about Flagstaff is that it's, uh, it's this really fantastic, magical place that you, if you're here, you had to, you put some effort into being here. No, I, I think that I agree with everything that he was saying. Um, one of the cool things about my job is, <clears throat> I get to meet people every day that are from all over the world, really, um, coming to Flagstaff to obviously visit Flagstaff, but um, also visit the Grand Canyon, visit Sedona, visit, visit all these places that it could be their first and last time to ever come here. And they spent a lot of money to travel here, to see those places. Um, so I'm constantly reminded that we live in a really unique place. Even though the, the bummer about it being so hard to live here and you have to work for it is you, you don't have a lot of time to, to spend in those places and enjoy them. But I think that probably in the last five years, we put a lot of effort into that. It just takes more effort to, to go visit those places, to enjoy them, to mm -hmm. hike or camp or fish, all those things. But we do live in a really, really cool place with those things but the community of Flagstaff is really unique you know it's a lot of people think well it's a mountain town so there's a lot of hippie people here right. that's not necessarily the case here um, you have all kinds of people and Misty my wife told me those things before we moved here that you know well, you have the east side of town where there's a lot of you know um, people that are into having horses and you know just animals like that and in that culture but then you also have this hippie culture in Flagstaff because it is a mountain town um, and then because of the school in AU you have another layer of culture in that so what I love about Flagstaff is one day I could be tattooing a hippie the next day I could be tattooing somebody that has a small farm that's you know that type of culture so it's just really really unique in that way and i love that that's what i love about my job that's what i love about flagstaff that i don't i don't only get one type of person i get all types of people here and i get to interact with them i get to hang out with them i get to become friends with them you know i think it just kind of goes back to everything we were just set, you know talking about is the diversity of the community is the best part of community so yeah 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 it's so cool to hear Man, well, I love you too. Um, I, yeah, some of my greatest laughs and memories are with you guys and just uh, being able to sit down and have you share a little bit about yourselves and your story and um, the full circle thing that Dan was speaking to earlier is really cool to see right now or to hear right now. And so I appreciate y'all coming through. Yeah, thank yeah. you. I appreciate yeah. you. Thank you thank for you so much. inviting us. Yeah, yeah, no doubt. Years in the making. Yeah. <laughs> I'm a clean slate. I don't have any tattoos. So it's I was time. thinking we could throw up a poll uh dragon or butterfly what about a both a uh, dragon butterfly, butterfly dragon. butter dragon <laughs> butter dragon <laughs> butter dragon i'll draw it <laughs> yeah jesse will draw a dragon saddling up a butterfly yeah, yeah i'll tattoo it <laughs> okay oh yeah all right. it's good <laughs> all right well thank you all all right haven't said farewell to jesse and tim uh yeah what, what what stood out to you about that interview? Man, that was a fun one, huh? <laughs> Good times. It was it was a lot more tame than I yeah. went in thinking. I was anticipating. I was uh, generally, genuinely, 
generally and genuinely wondering if we were going to be able to use anything when we first sat down with <laughs> yeah. them. Yeah. <laughs> thinking there might be a lot of uh, sabotage, subverting, uh, just taking that conversation off the rails. But yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah kept it kept it on the rails. Definitely, man. Like just good, good people to sit with. Um, gosh, you know what really sticks out to me, and I think we talked a little bit about this, is just the degree to which their upbringing informs kind of how they go through the world now. Yeah. And they are so, both of them, right, are very intentional about creating connection and community in their businesses. Hmm. And I thought that really stood out to me. And what Tim does with, with his uh, art shows and giving to nonprofits in town, and then also what Jesse's been able to do with the powerlifting community and um, his current thing where they're raising money for veterans to have 24 seven access to the gym. Seem like they're very intentional about what they do and um, bringing people together. Yeah. Oh, for sure. Yeah. It seemed to inform the way that they tried to bring their teams together, but then tried to contribute to the community they're a part of. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah I, I think the thing that stood out to me is, uh, it's kind of where we started the fact that they've been friends since they were children since yeah. elementary school and there was a little bit of a gap when they didn't live near each other but from middle school on pretty consistent yeah and uh that's pretty remarkable to develop a bond that way watching them interact with each other it's like they kind of knew where each other was going or what each other meant on a different level yeah in the responses that were given so it's pretty remarkable how yeah, how symbiotic their interactions seem to be to me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it's kind of fun hearing them banter a little bit. And then um, I don't think we got too far into this, but also how things ended up in them becoming brother-in-laws, brothers-in-law, yeah. <laughs> brother-ins-law, whatever the term is. Brothers-in-law. Brothers-in-laws, yeah. And uh, that's a that's a wild thing too, huh? Yeah, the, they're family. literally family. Literally family. Yeah. yeah. So they look out for one another. So they spend like holidays together, they, like spare moments, Jesse and Tim rolling yeah. out. No doubt. Yeah. Yeah. So it was, yeah, really fun interview and uh, I'm very grateful for them to share their time with us. Yeah. Well, why don't you take us out by shouting us out? No doubt. You can always find us on the interwebs, www.beyondflag.com, flag spelled. F-L-G. You can find us on the Instagram sometimes. We out there. Also, beyond underscore flag. We out there. We out there. And uh, Twitters, we are not out there. Well, X. X is. X, X is X. <laughs> X is X name. X name. Don't find us there. <laughs> You can also check out one of our other shows, The Build Up with Molly Sayo and Julia Hanlon. You can check out Quick and Nerdy with Dan and I. And we would definitely encourage you to check out Crossing the Chasm with Brian C. Peterson. The pod god. The pod god. Thanks for the shanty, pod god. Yeah, big shout. All right, take care. Love you. Thanks for coming to my podcast. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> New my roots. Bad. My bad. We need the air horn, man. We got the.